Okay, I would like to uh, get started. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the first public lecture of uh, this spring semester. Um, there is still some widespread perception that imagination and creative design as an intellectual pursuit is almost exclusively lodged in the profession of architects, while engineers are there to make things work. Making the building stand up indeed is one of the challenges of the structural engineer and his or her design task traditionally would be primarily that of designing the flow of loads through the structure as to achieve safety and efficiency. But there's much more to engineering. In recent years, architects again have become interested in the tectonic aspects of buildings, in materials and fabrication, striving for an innovation that can result when new technologies intersect with ambitious design agendas. But even before architects rediscovered structure as a driver of architectural design, it was engineers that trespassed the boundary towards architecture. Engineers, indeed, played a major role in shaping many of the buildings that have become inspiration for generations of architects and, and more and other people. And engineers' increasingly visible role in the design process has undoubtedly contributed to the return of tectonic thinking in the profession of architects at large. At this point, we understand well that great architecture often requires the cross-breeding of design ideas between architects and engineers in the early design stages. Accepting engineers as equal partners in the shaping of architecture has not become the norm, but certainly it's finding, again, broader acceptance today. It is this time and right for us to invite to the GSD Guy Nordensen as a design engineer, academic, and researcher. He represents better than most the new type of imaginative engineer. Guy Nordensen is a structural engineer by training and a professor of structural engineering and architecture at, Yale Uni at Princeton University. Yale refers to his recently completed project, uh, a pedestrian bridge, uh, one at Yale University and one at the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York. Current projects include the expansion of the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth and the Smithsonian Institute's National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. He curated MoMA's Tall Buildings exhibition and his research inspired the MoMA's Rising Currents workshop and exhibition in 2010. His most recent book and today's talk are titled Patterns and Structure. Please welcome Guy Nordensen. <clears throat> We can fade the lights a little bit because it's a little hard to see the screen, I think. Um, if anybody's up there, there you are. Oh, well, not too much because otherwise everybody's going to. So the, the title of the lecture corresponds to the book. You can hold up the book, Martin. Buy the book. Um, but it's a little bit off center from from the, the, the book and is, in effect, a reflection on, on, on the theme that is in the, um, in the texts that are in the book. Um, there's a very nice blurb, by the way, at the back of the book for which I thank your esteemed professor here, Antoine Picon, um, and it's a great pleasure to have Antoine and John Oxendorf here um, as well. The theme of patterns and structure for me is, an, is, is something that I've been um, circling around for many years in my classes and in my um, writings and, 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 and practice. And it's a way for me to think about um, the, the, the nature of what engineering practice is um, as I've experienced it and the relationship of that to the practice of architecture. And the, the, the the, the, the opposition or the relationship between patterns and structure is related, I think, to the relationship between the individual's accomplishment and, and, and achievement in design and that of the collective. And it's also the relationship between appearance and reality or appearance and underlying structure that may not always be so um, visible in, in appearance. So there is a kind of duality that's built into this, which has a cultural aspect 
in being a reflection on how we work and how engineers and architects collaborate. Um, but it's also a reflection on, on the relationship between the appearance of what we do and the appearance of what we make, and in some cases, the underlying structure. And, and I start with this quote from Emerson being here in, at Harvard um, and, and, and in New England, because I think it illustrates this, this um, challenge of balancing our own self-discovery in the creative process, our own search for expression that is authentic, at the same time as our effort to come to some kind of understanding of underlying realities and underlying truths, if you will, which we can hold in common. And I think that's something that comes into play in design all the time and has applications in other parts of our lives, but also in the greater um, society at, at, at large. I want to start with a theme um, which is this idea of vortex, um, which is a term that, that I picked up from, from Ezra Pound a long time ago when I was a student down the street at, at MIT. Um, in, vortex, in, in the concept of vortex for Ezra Pound, it was, it, was, it was a description of a historic situation that he saw occurring at different times in different places, which to him was extremely attractive a moment where there was a conjunction of political will and cultural potential that allowed certain things to happen. In the Renaissance, um, he was particularly fascinated with Sigismundo Malatesta and the Tempio Malatesta in Rimini as the example of, of, of a, the product of a convergence of talent around one thing that was made possible by an authoritarian and actually rather ruthless um, uh, Condottieri but was significant because of the people that it brought together, Alberti, Duccio, all the folks, Piero della Francesca, that were involved in that, in that particular situation. And he looked throughout history in China, in other places, and unfortunately in Mussolini, at situations which he saw as these kinds of cultural vortices. And I think despite his flaws, he put his finger on something quite important that has resonated for me um, ever since. And there are a lot of examples historically that, you can, that I think you can point to where the, 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 the product, the object of a creative venture somehow transcends the circumstances that it was, it, it, in which it was created. So this, this is the pavilion. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. There's a very nice book that you probably have here in the library um, written by Billy Kluver on this project that he did with Bob Rauschenberg and many others for the expo, a very wonderful expo, by the way, in Osaka in, in, in 67, which was the, the result of one of the collaborations uh, of the kind that Rauschenberg actually started to organize between engineers, architects, um, artists, scientists, coming together and creating these collaborative um, ventures and these strange objects. This thing was this mist-covered um, geometric object that had all kinds of happenings going on, on inside. It was a temporary pavilion like the Phillips Pavilion and Mark Tribe's really good book on this um, tells the story of how Korb's collaboration with Klinakis, um, the, the very complicated relationship between the two of them, the absence of Korb when he was going to India during this period of time, but also the difficulty that they had in putting this together, in figuring out based on Xenakis' preconceptions of how it would be made, how it actually could be made. And they had many false starts, and Tribe writes about this um, in detail. And it's unique as a, as a project, I think, in the, in the, in the corpus of, of Le Corbusier. And it's that kind of uniqueness, I think, which is what this idea of vortex is trying to, to identify. The Minio is another example, a situation where you had not only Piano and, of course, the client, Dominique de Minio, but you also had Walter Hopps, the great um, um, uh, museum director, but also gallery um, director in Los Angeles, who, who organized the first show of, of Marcel Duchamp at the Pasadena Museum. 
uh, the first show in the United States, and you had um, Pontus Hilton, who had run the Pompidou and, and, and helped conceive of that. Lots of different people, Peter Rice, Tom Barker, coming together around this project at a moment in each of their lives where this was something critical and significant, and I think the building shows that. The building is not really, the building doesn't really have a single author. It's really more the manifestation of a particular vortex at that time in, in history. Um, Rice was very um, attached to the Victorian idea that, 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 that the trace of the hands of the workers be the, the trace de la main, he always somehow referred to it in French, would be manifest in, in the object, so that the way in which the leaves that make up the roof were, were, were finished, whether they were crosswise or lengthwise, is something that you can see in the building um, from the way the light reflects. And, and, and Rice, if you took you around, would tell you, well, that was made by, by Gary, and that was made by, by, by Joe, just from the way in which the light reflected. So, so a very strong humanist um, perspective, I think, also on on the making of, of buildings. The Beinecke, another example of, for me, of this kind of a situation. I think um, the Beinecke, in my view, is unique in the, in the body of, of Bunchath's work. Um, it, it was conce I, I, I It's hard to get to the root of where it came from because Bunchath wasn't particularly articulate and there's tapes, you know, there are tapes at Yale that you can listen to, but I haven't, I'm not aware of of a very clear explanation of why he set, about, set out to make the building the way it is. But you know, it's this jewel box around the rare books. Um, it sits, as you can see, on, on four, or appears to sit on these four legs and floats as this kind of precious object above those. Um, and there's some sort of classic Ezra Stoller shots. That's the the detail. Um, notice the fact that the support is here, not at the corner, and you'll see the structure is actually at the, at the face. The support is not at the face. So there are lots of interesting expressionistic moves that happen in the way it was developed. The structure is this grid that you see here. The panels are translucent stone. This is, this is a, a kind of semi-public space, and then the rare books are in here. And notice how the light comes flooding in underneath and, and seems to almost levitate the building. This is some shots of the frame under construction. It was a Virendale frame that was built up of, of what they called butterfly frames that were made of plates, marrying the structure to the moment diagram. So a very rationalist approach to the structure, but in the end really manifest more by the way in which the light and shadow was playing. And so collapsing completely the structure, the transparency, the materiality into something that in a way is a kind of or Herzog kind of, of, of ambiguity of material um, happening long before, um, before that, that theory developed. And no one involved really thought of it in those terms. They were just doing it in this particular way. Um, Weidlinger was the engineer. Matt Levy was, assisted him. You know, you had, again, this very interesting collection, the, the Beineke's themselves, but also the contractor who were the ones that introduced Bunshaft to, um, to Yale. Again, a moment in history unique in the circumstances of the lives of everyone who was, um, who was involved. Now, in the Beinecke, the, the, the sophistication of the design and the sophistication of the integration of the design and the ambiguity of, oh, I forgot, actually, the ambiguity of the structural development here, you can see the corner is very thin. And down here, you can see there's a cross beam there. And that cross beam is actually where you have the um, support. So the support is, is displaced from where the structure is. So there's some very clear rhetorical shifts that happen in the development of the, of the design that are significant in the expression of this volume floating, floating on light, as you see it from the inside, but also held in a very very clear and articulate way that actually is contradictory if you think about the way the structure works. So that sophisticated rhetorical development is, I think, part of what is significant about a project like that. It's not what it appears. That it, 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 it's something that you can only really start to appreciate 
the, 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 the beauty and sophistication of it if you dig into the details, if you start to see maybe by studying working drawings or construction photographs how the thing got, got put together, not from a, you know, uh, the sense of how would I do it, but also from the sense of by taking it apart, understanding better what it means. Uh, the World Trade Center towers, I think, are perhaps one of the best examples of this. Um, after 9-11, when we were working on this show on tall buildings for MoMA, I had a class work on developing a drawing which was um, a representation of the type of steel that was in the building. Um, it turned out that Les Robertson, who designed the structure of this building, um, developed a system that everyone had, had recognized as being innovative, which was this tube frame of closely spaced columns and stiff beams, similar to, to the Sears Tower, similar to other um, tube frames that were being developed at that time. But in his case, one thing that he did that no one else did and has ever done since, to my knowledge, is also design the different kinds of material that would go into this. And so if you look at the working drawings, you'll find that there are actually 14 different types of steel that are used in the structure, um, everything from 36 KSI steel up to 100 KSI steel. And so we drew this, this map, which represents the type of steel that was used in all the different units that made up the structure of, of this building. As you can see from, from this, the building structure was made from these, what they call trees, so these panels of three columns and, and two beams that were bolted together at these, at these joints. So within one of these panels, if you look at the working drawings, there's a very organized tabular description of, you know, this plate is this type, that plate is that type, the plate's around the side of the so-and-so. It's this thick and it's this steel. And so what we were representing here is the type of steel and also the type of, of unit that, that occurred unfolding facade of the two buildings. Now, the reason that, that Robertson did this, these are the types, sort of legend. The reason that Robertson did this was that, that from the calculations that he had done, both directly with simple wind um, forces, but also from the results of the wind tunnel study that they did, he found, as was typical with tube frames, that it was very difficult to get a lot of the stresses and the force to move past the corner and into the center of the body of, of each face. You know, in a tube frame, the idea is the entire perimeter of the structure is mobilized, and so the front and back uh, faces of the building become like flanges of a box beam. Well, the problem in getting that to work is if you've got a lot of perforations, the stresses don't really want to get all the way around the corner into the center, something they call shear lag. Well, what Robinson realized was that if he used very high strength steels around the corners, he could get away with smaller members. And by getting away with smaller members, he could make them less stiff. And because they were less stiff, they would shed load toward the interior. And so counterintuitively, he was taking the highest stressed members and making them smaller so that they would unload to the other members and get more of them to participate. And he did that by making them stronger, therefore being able to make them smaller. Now, in mapping this, we are also mapping the fact that you have these two towers that were analyzed for winds coming from all directions, reflecting the probability of different kinds of winds from those different directions, what's called the wind rows. So <coughs> in the wind tunnel, they were recognizing the particular wind environment and also recognizing the fact that these two buildings sheltered each other. So what you would get in this map is the design of this nuanced relationship of, of stiffness and strength, but also the manifestation of that environment and of the position of these two towers in relationship to each other. And it's something I think very powerful from my perspective because it is so invisible. When we did this drawing, we revealed something that you know, Les knew about, other people knew about, but no one had ever really visualized and understood and appreciated as what I think is one of the more extraordinary creative um, uh, acts by an engineer in, in, in the 20th century. And it's that kind of thing, um, this is a quote from 
that Wittgenstein described as his favorite quote. It's the kind of thing which under certain, in certain times, in certain aesthetic environments, was highly valued. It's that beauty that is hidden, not beauty that is, is, is so directly apparent. And I think that's an important characteristic of, of, this, of this theme that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to elaborate. So when you look at this, you're looking at the conscious effort to move forces around to get a more efficient system, but you're also looking at the representation of the wind environment and the, the, the physical environment of, of that building. Crown Hall is another case of this. I think, um, for me, it's very interesting and sophisticated. Um, if you go into the archive at MoMA, the correspondence between Mies and his, his, engineers, his engineer, Frank Kornacher, very interesting correspondence back and forth between the two of them about you know, the, the susceptibility of these girders to lateral torsional buckling, the fact that the top of them in compression is not stabilized, how he dealt with that, the fact the contractor didn't believe they would stand up back and forth between them on some of these more sophisticated issues, but also the extreme ambiguity of the support system, the fact that you have some differentiation between the columns, which are slightly bigger, and the mullions, the appearance of a hierarchy between columns and mullions where the columns look, look bigger and appear to be, because they're at the ends of the girders, to be primary. But in fact, the mullions, who are, which are welded to the fascia beam, are also functioning, are also holding things up. They're not freed up in a way that would reflect that kind of differentiation. So this is holding that up even though this is holding that up. There's, 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 there's all kinds of layers of ambiguity which I think <coughs> are a significant part of the, the meaning of this because when you get inside, and this is maybe something that Bunchev was echoing with the, with the Beinecke, when you get inside, you have this sense again of this pillow of light that is, that's, that is holding up the building, you know, emphasized by the fact that the, the ceiling is folded up so that the light comes, comes blasting in both from above and from all around, and you can't tell what's column and what's mullion. You basically have this, this, this very smooth edge somehow that looks like there's no structure at all. So you come in from what is at the outside, very hierarchical, very clearly organized, though there are some layers of, of ambiguity in the reality of how the structure works, to something on the inside, which is completely ethereal and quite different. So, those are sort of the touchstones for me of, of the, the, the kind of inspiration that's um, <clears throat> helped me understand what, what, um, what's going on in, 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 in the projects that I've been involved in. So I want to show you a few of those and, and give you some examples of where there are things going on which are not of a, of a visual kind, but are still, in, in, in my view, of, of value in understanding, or at least for me, in my understanding of the meaning of these, of these projects. So one building that I was involved in was, was the MoMA, working with Taniguchi. Um, I'm glad to read the other day that Roberta Smith has finally come around and feels that it isn't such a disaster. Um, it was amazing when the building opened the amount of, 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 of hostility and antagonism from the art, art community for, for this building. Very strong reaction. Um, most of what we did in developing the structure of this building was fairly conventional. We, we were working to come up with a geometry. Um, there's actually a sort of hidden golden section tatami geometry that's built into the, 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 the size of the base of the structure. Um, which we sort of built into this, which nobody actually knew about, but it was our little secret. Um, but visible is the, the, the design that was done for, for the glass walls that face the garden, and then another aspect, which I'll show you in a second. These glass walls are, I think, significant um, from an optical point of view, more than actually a visual point of view. If you look at this, and the, and the next time in your New York and you get a chance to, 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 to sort of take this position, I think it's, it's, it's surprising how thin these, these lines are, and there's a sense that they're a little bit too thin, that there's something slightly vibratory and disturbing about that, 
about that thinness. And, and I mean, what it is is a fairly simple structure. They, these are solid steel mullions and solid steel um, horizontals. They're, they're, they're connected through a mortise and tendon systems, very much like a kind of Japanese carpentry idea, and then bolted from the outside tight to make it into a rigid frame so the thing holds itself up and, and is, is kept from buckling by the stiffness of the frame um, overall. And here they go up um, 60 feet, so they're two inches by seven inches, so they're very small for, for the scale of this wall, but otherwise fairly mute, I think. They're not, um, it's not really calling that much attention to itself in, in, its, in its extreme thinness. Um, the other piece of the, um, of the design that was, was uh, perhaps notable was the fact that, that at a certain point, um, <clears throat> when we were a good ways into the design, we had a meeting with the, the director and others, and somewhere through the meeting, um, Glenn Lowry said that one of the trustees was very unhappy that there were too many columns. And nothing very, very specific about it, but there was just a feeling about there being too many columns. So I went home and, and was thinking about this and realized that, that the way we had developed the structure of the, the tower portion of this building, we had a belt truss just at the level above the highest gallery where the tower begins at a level which was a, um, it's actually a conser conservation laboratory in there. And that wrapped all the way around the building to tie the core trusses that we had where the elevators were here to the rest of the structure and add stiffness to, to the core, which is quite slender. And so we had these belt trusses here and here which were there to provide some additional stiffness against the, the wind and, and seismic forces. Since these were in place, it wasn't that difficult to offer to take the columns out of the contemporary art gallery here and suspend the rest of it from the truss up there. Since the cost of these trusses were already built into the, um, the cost estimate, I mean, in terms of the material, but also especially the fabrication and the, and the erection, by just adding enough material to make this possible, we weren't really adding, sort of on a unit basis, that much more cost, because the unit cost of more material is very different than the unit cost of, of, of the thing fabricated and put in place. So it's like a third the unit cost of the whole uh, of, of, of normal rate for, for steel. So we could come back and say, look, we could take these two columns out of here, and it would only cost you $10,000 per column or some number like that. Of course, that was a big hit, and everybody thought this was extraordinary that somehow we were able to do this. It was just pure luck that the thing was set up so that we were able to do that. Um, we did it, and it became so much a part of the, the sort of urban legend around the building that they used to take dignitaries who would come and visit the project under construction to this spot, all these sort of VIPs who weren't necessarily that interested in architecture but were interested in the museum, and the fellow who would take them around was named was Just, Justin Rockefeller, would, would come and take them to this spot and say, you know what's extraordinary is that the column is gone. And the tour group would stand there and look at him and look at the spot and, okay. But if the column hadn't been gone, this is what it would have looked like when the, when the Sarah show was done. So I love it because it's a moment that is built into the, 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 the story of the building. A lot of people have remembered, but it's a moment that has to do with something disappearing. Now, oh, there it is. Sorry, there's a circle there. Um, down the street, a couple years ago, we did this um, dormitory with Steve Hall. Steve had this idea that because it was the first building that was going to be built on Vassar Street, that it was very important that the building express a, a, an idea of porosity. And so the, um, the basic concept was this sort of gridded system that would have these big cutouts and holes going through it, so you had this feeling of transparency, partly because of the, the sort of flatness of that, of that grid. And then you had also these 
big holes in there which manifested also this idea that this was kind of like a sponge and you had these public spaces. Sponge. Taking this geometry as a starting point, we um, developed uh, a, an approach which was to take that and transform it directly into a Virendale structure so that we would have a framework of concrete elements vertically and horizontally that would act as a perimeter tube, much like the, the tube frame of the World Trade Center, and that that would facilitate um, spanning over these big openings, but also working around these cantilevers that occurred at, at the corners. We decided to make it a very uniform grid and have all the members be the same size and have them all with four bars in each one. So there was a certain constancy to that, to that aspect. But then we added in the possibility of variation that would reflect some of the special cases that were playing uh, on, on the structure. So where we had a spanning situation and we're overstressing some, stressing some of these elements, we dealt with that by filling in the, the square. And so we were strengthening it that way as opposed to making the elements um, larger. And it was a bit of a game because we would have to analyze the whole thing, see where things were overstressed, put panels in where that was happening. And because each time you put in a panel, you affected the distribution of forces, you would then sort of follow along through a sequence that would take you to a particular pattern, which wasn't obviously the only possible pattern. So we would take that pattern to, the, um, to Stephen's office, and then they would say, well, you know, there's a couple places here where you're right in the middle of a house master's living room or something like that, which doesn't work. So we'd backtrack and, and sort of find another path to, to a solution that made, made some sense. And so what you get is a pattern that was, was, was um, impacted by architectural considerations and, and the result of that, of that back and forth. It was made by these kind of sort of Lego set units. Um, each of these legs, seven legs, these are 20 feet by 10 feet. Each of these seven legs has four prongs, so the four um, bars, which would plug in to the one coming in from above. So we had a, a detail where they met each other. And after they got, you know, initially the contractor wasn't very enthusiastic about this idea, and it took us a while to persuade him. But once they got into the construction, it went pretty smoothly. It would take them about 35 minutes to get one of these things up off the truck and in place. So they'd bring it up, they'd test it to see if it fit, they'd lift it up again, shim it, um, then uh, fill in the gaps and, and complete, the, um, complete the assembly. The slab, by the way, went all the way out, so you actually had a, almost like a, a brick wall in a way. You had a mortar joint of the slab coming out and filling the gap between, between the units. Now, um, one of the things that emerged actually during construction um, one of the engineers who was working, uh, we were collaborating with Simpson, Gumpers, and Hager on this, and the engineer working in, in their office on the site um, had prepared a drawing that she used to double check whether the rebar in each of the legs of the precast panel was correct. And so she was walking around with this drawing and she had it color coded to the rebar size. And I saw this and knew that Stephen was interested in some kind of color pattern on the facade and so with a little bit of back and forth, we agreed that the color back that the color pattern would be a direct representation of the size of the bars, which of course are a direct representation of the stresses. So in the end, you had this color pattern which which represented what was in effect the stress diagram on the um, on the on the structure. Now I tell a story which is not a true story. I have to admit this to you, John. Uh, that I once got an email from a student um, at MIT pointing out, have, having done a study of this, that this one should be red and not <laughs> yellow. But it's not a true story. But it's a good story. Um, the church in Rome that was meant to be for the year 2000, so now 10 years ago, it took longer so it, it, was, it was called the Church of the Year 2000 until the year 2000. When it wasn't finished, they changed the name to the Jubilee Church. <clears throat> and then it was finished a couple years after the year 2000. 
and a few years passed, and then they changed the name back to the year 2000. So now it's known as the Church of the Year 2000 because nobody remembers that it wasn't finished by the year 2000. But this was a um, competition that Richard Meyer won. Um, very interesting competition. It was um, mostly American um, architects that were invited by the Vatican to compete and mostly Jewish American architects that were invited by the Vatican to compete on the project. In fact, I think all the competitors were, um, almost all the competitors were not Catholic, um, which was interesting. But yet, we're expected to have an understanding of the liturgical needs of this, of this church. It, was on the outskirts, it is on the outskirts of Rome, and Richard came up with this rather unusual design, I think, for him, which was these, these nested um, shells kind of a Richard Serra inspired perhaps, but, but quite compelling and really quite successful in the end. Uh, after we won the competition, we had a long discussion about how these would be made. And I was advocating that they be exposed concrete and there was a strong pushback about that because of the worry that as exposed concrete, it would be too tectonic, that, that, that you would lose the abstraction that is important for um, Meyer's architecture. And so very long and, and, and extensive conversation back and forth. Finally, it was really the Roman engineers that we were working with, many of whom were protégés of, of Pierluigi Nervi, so fond of precasting, fond of concrete, and especially the company that was going to build it, Italcimente, which is the main cement company of Italy and powerful and rich and willing to um, contribute to the project. So between all of them, the idea that this be exposed concrete finally took hold, and Meyer agreed, and we went forward. And so we then developed this system together with um, the engineers and Italcimente, where these were made from prefabricated panels made in northern Italy near Bergamo, where their um, plant is about two meters square and 80 centimeters thick, um, more or less solid, that would be stacked up. So a little bit like the MIT um, system of prefabricated large-scale bricks making up the building. And a lot of it at MIT and a lot of it here for me also had, um, which is a somewhat different theme, had this idea of the kind of theatricality of, of the construction process, which here was very much the case. Italcimente came up with this thing which we called La Machina, which was this gigantic gantry with a platform in it which was used to, to build the thing. And so the panels, this is early on in construction, the panels would come out um, from the factory. They had rails set up on the ground. There's a basement underneath, so they first built the basement. And then the rails were set up. And then this thing would roll back and forth, building first the outermost wall, then the next one, then the next one. So then when they were done, they shifted it to the next set of rails. But it was moving um, pretty slowly and for many years back and forth building this thing um, up. So there you see one of the panels in the platform, on the platform in the jig that was computer operated that positioned the, the block um, where it needed to go. So it, it was lifted up, put into the jig, turned around, and then, and then it, was, it was fully, um, fully computerized and fully um, five axis um, um, free so it could really get the thing in the right spatial position to go down and, and to be placed. And then couplers that tied the post-tensioning rods that went through them all. And then finally, um, once the whole thing was installed, cables that would tie the whole thing together. Um, they would put one up in the morning, have lunch, come back, and put one up in the afternoon and go home. It was great. Every four months, I'd go to Rome, I'd check it out, have lunch. Four months later, come back. Wonderful project. Took forever. And the people that lived there in the, in the area watched this. So kids grew up watching this big red thing going back and forth. You know, and I'm sure they're all now studying engineering um, in Rome. So this is what it looks like inside. Um, I won't go into detail, but there's a, there's a nice little structure on the top that holds up this glass roof. But you see, these are really cut out. So it's quite an interesting um, 
thing to imagine, you know, made up of pieces, and you still see the, the joints there. So you still do get, I think, the abstract feeling. And in particular, um, uh, I'll come back to this in a second. In particular, I think because um, one of the decisions that Meyer made, which was critical, was that he, he sliced it in the way that we were going to prefabricate it. Instead of slicing it along great circles in both directions, he decided to slice it on great, great circles horizontally, but on, on parallel circles in the other direction. So instead of having this feeling of a kind of inflated sail, you have a grid that has, I think, a more interesting and abstract um, presence um, because of that, of that relationship. It made the panels harder to, to, to um, detail because the joint um, was all different. So I mean, it was, it was a very complex piece of, of geometric variation as you went around those different cuts and also included the chamfer that each of those panels had. So quite a complex piece of work that was done. Now, because it was going to be precast um, and exposed, Meyer was adamant that it was going to be extremely white and uniform. And so Ital Chimente struggled through one after another after another mock-up Many times we had to go back and have, have a look at the mock-ups until Meyer was satisfied with the whiteness of, of the concrete. And they found, in the end, that the way to get it as white as he wanted was to put titanium oxide, I think it's titanium oxide or titanium dioxide, I don't remember, in that the effect of doing that was also to make it very um, self-cleaning, that, that the, the, the effect of the titanium dioxide was that when the water, when the rain washes on the surface, there's a, it's almost like a Teflon surface that it washes off all the dirt. When it's not raining on a regular day, it actually precipitates some of the dust in the air. So it's actually collecting dust and pollution, and then in the rain, dropping it down to the ground. So it is actually contributing to the solution to um, climate change. and, and um, Itachimente figured this out, and if you go to their website, they advertise now this concrete as the best thing and their thing and something you should buy for your projects. But originally, it only came into existence because it had to be white. The um, Toledo project, um, another exercise in abstraction. This is the you probably familiar with this, the glass center of, of Sejima and Ishizawa. Very strong um, sort of diagrammatic will behind the project where you have this, 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 this bubble diagram, if you will, of the program that in the end is, is effectively the project. Um, this is it completed. Um, this is it during construction. The, you know, again, an exercise in, in, in minimalism where there are many things going on um, about the system which are sublimated into the, 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 the final result. Um, one of the things that we had to deal with, which was very complex, was the, the cambering of the system to make it as absolutely flat as we could make it. And in fact, the contractor stumbled in this area, but, but we, um, we were really limited by how much things could be allowed to deflect once you put the load on. So we were trying to bow as many of the members in different ways as we, as we possibly could, um, all of which to get that um, simplicity. And then, of course, everything woven into everything else. So very complicated three-dimensional exercise of you know, getting the drainage slopes, getting the, 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 the Sprinkler system, everything all woven into this sort of almost like printed circuit of a structure and, um, and integrated system. One of the things I'm very happy with um, that was kind of a circumstantial result of the design process, the columns were located, and you can see this in the, um, sorry, you can see this in the plan here. The columns are located along these girder lines pretty erratically to reflect their position relative to the voids between these, these glass um, rooms. So they're, they're pretty, pretty frequently located in these cavities, which are also where the services come up. 
And so when you go into the space, it's very hard to, to comprehend a total geometry of that, of that structural arrangement. And so most people, when they come in and, and when, they, when they come away from this building, are convinced that it's the glass that's holding up the roof. That just, it's hard to see the, 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 the steel columns, besides the fact that they're small, but especially, I think, because of their arrangement. Now, you mentioned this bridge, which we just completed at, at Yale. Um, this was a project that we were invited into by Cesar Pelli. Oops. Sorry. Um, it's, it's a bridge. Two, two little pedestrian bridges on Hill House Avenue, which is one of the streets. Um, um, it, it's actually the street that goes up to the science complex at Yale. And it's a very beautiful street with some very old houses. And one of the trustees at um, Yale has made himself sort of the patron of this street, which he is very fond of. And so he had a particular interest in this, in this project, which was to replace a small little road bridge um, for Hill House Avenue. And Pelly had the idea that instead of replacing it as it was with a bridge, and so would pull the sidewalks away and have two little bridges separate from the road bridge. And so we were asked to come in and work on the bridges. And we had to develop a, um, a scheme that, that sort of thread the needle between something that was progressive from our perspective, but also appealed to the rather traditional tastes of this um, trustee and also of the, of the folks at Yale who wanted to maintain what they saw as the character of Hill House Avenue. And so I had in mind this, this bridge in um, London and in Regent Park, which is fairly typical of the, of the sort of Victorian type of lattice bridge um, like, like this, and developed um, from that a design which was a perforated structure like that, so like a lattice structure, but one that was also corrugated. And so the notion here is to, to corrugate the web in such a way that you can make it out of very, very thin plate and protect it from the buckling that would happen from the shear forces at the end and also from the potential buckling of the top flange that is um, unsupported in the middle where the moments are large and therefore the compression in that top flange is large. So there's corrugation here that is basically acting as a vertical cantilever to hold that top flange and corrugation at the end that is keeping the web where the high shears are from, from buckling. And between, it's less corrugated. So you get this variation from the, the, the tight, loose, tight, loose, and so on as you, as you move through. And it was very hard to, and some of the analysis, it, it's acting essentially as a kind of Virendale system um, to deal with the forces. Difficult to fabricate, lots of tolerance challenges in getting this very thin, it's quarter inch thick um, web to be um, adequately straight and, and plumb. But it was, it was ultimately very well made um, by a guy named Steve Horn in East New York. Um, and Go back quickly to the, and when you get to it now, um, it, it, very, it was very hard to anticipate, at least for me, the, the quality that you would get from that variation. So it's a very nice case, I think, of where just a very simple idea can, can lead to something quite, um, um, quite unexpected in its, in its, in its variations. Um, the, getting close to the end here, this is a project which I worked on a couple of years ago, um, which was an alternative broadcast tower for New York when it was unclear whether or not the World Trade Center, the big tower that's now under construction, was going to go ahead. And it was a design that we had developed actually in 2002 for a magazine um, that Herbert Mouchon had organized a, a collection of projects after 9-11. Um, to try to stimulate the dialogue. And so we um, came up with this tower idea, which was based on seven um, tubes going up in different directions, not intersecting with one another, but bypassing one another, and then linked together to create essentially a kind of 
negative space within that that would uh, become this tower, connected along the height by these kind of calligraphic um, um, links. Now, we revisited the idea a couple years later for a site out in the harbor of, of New York and started to play with the possibility that the arrangement of these pipes could be done in such a way that they would shield each other effectively from, from the wind, the way that, say, a group of bicyclists um, protect each other as they, as they go um, one behind the other. And it turns out um, from research that's been done for paired cables that there is a sweet spot where if you space two cylinders in the wind about three diameters apart, that the, the drag on the two is actually less than the drag on one of them. Um, you'd expect that you know, the, the, the sweet spot would be that the drag on two is equal to the drag on one, but you can actually get a situation where the drag on two is less than the drag on just one cable. So taking inspiration from that um, fact, we did a series of, of studies looking at the windrows for, for New York and then looking at various ways in which we could position these things um, starting with a benchmark relationship of, of just a regular arrangement, but then looking into irregular arrangements to see if from certain angles we could position them in such a way that we would minimize the drag of the group. And we came up with the idea of what we call the drag rows. So you, know, you have the wind rows, which tells you that, say, in New York, if you're looking at hurricane winds or nor'easters, they come from the nor'east with the strong winds or from the southwest. And so the very, very strong winds have that kind of slight bulge in that, along that axis. So if we could create a bulge that is perpendicular to that axis, effectively creating less drag in the worst direction, we were, we were making a, a drag rose that was orthogonal to the, to the wind rose. Um, and my colleague, Ted Zoli, developed these diagrams for how we might try to calculate from the, 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 the earlier research um, what that shape would be, and then test it in the wind tunnel and test it in the, in the CFD models. So this would be a little bit like the World Trade Center Tower, the case where the object was representing the circumstances of, of, of the environment. Um, I'll close with um, just a few remarks which are kind of um, more, more, more recent, maybe, and, and, and local. I think on this question of patterns and structure, what I'm, you know, when you, when you watch a Hitchcock movie, there's something about Hitchcock for me, the suspense and the mystery of, of, of that, that is related to what I think are the opportunities in structural design. And I came across recently this quote um, from Carlo Ginsburg um, that, that talks about how there is this approach to discovering knowledge, which is this kind of, of, of unraveling of a mystery that, that is, is, in his view, characteristic of historical research, but I think is also characteristic of design research um, as well. I think that details matter. Um, there's um, the Lever House, um, before it was recently restored, in my, rec in my memory of it, had a very interesting situ situation where they had these panels of different colors around the, the spandrel. Um, these are some pictures from the 60s and, and 70s. And when it was restored, that difference was erased. So when they reclad the thing, um, not only did they make the panel of glass this size with a fake divider in between, so now the spandrel panel, which used to be two panels, is now one, but they eradicated the, the, the difference that, that was there before. Now, I'm pretty sure that no one involved in the process, in fact, I wrote a letter at the time protesting this, and I'm quite sure that no one involved in the process had stopped for one second to think about whether or not this made a difference. But I think it does. And, and I remember asking some of the people involved in the design. In fact, I showed this once at Yale, and Gordon Smith, who was there, um, said I was, I was totally wrong about this. But I think there is something about the reality of this variation that was um, part of the character and, and meaning of that building, and that our, our loss of, of understanding and attention to details like that is, is a significant loss. So finally, um, down the road when I was a student here, there was, there was a, um, 
professor named Cyril Stanley Smith, who, who taught and, and has been, for me, a big influence over the years. Um, Smith uh, was a metallurgist who went, um, who, who published this book, which you can still get online in some places. Um, part of a, 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 a cultural environment that included Ruth Benedict and many others um, in the 50s and 60s. And Smith was very interested in the relationship between, if you will, the kind of decorative aspects of crafts and the underlying understanding of the technology and science behind them. And so where the, 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 the knives that were made in Syria, the Damascus blades or, or swords that were made in Japan have a very sophisticated appearance of variation that you can see and that, that connoisseurs admire, there is behind that a variation in the quality of the steel, the ductility that exists at the backbone of the steel, the brittleness and sharp hardness that exists at the front of the blade, all of which are things that are, are developed into the sword through a very empirical process and yet reflect a very deep um, manifestation of, of, of the properties of the material and the opportunities of that material. And I think it's that kind of, of appreciation of the relationship between art and the motivation that drives craftsmen and artists to make things a certain way, and the fact that in many of these cases there's an underlying reality that is advancing in parallel to that, to that art, which is significant in, in, in Smith's writing and which is influential on, 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 on the stuff that's in this um, book. So layers of structure, layers of, of interrelationship between scale and, and so on, as he writes about in geometry, in physical, in, in natural phenomena. And he did with um, Judith Wexler, who was teaching at the time at, at MIT, these wonderful exhibitions of, of artifacts that, that represented the potential of a manufacturing method. You know, in this case, a lathe, um, ivory objects made on a lathe, and, um, and, and art. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, to varying degrees. I mean, I think even in cases where it's repressed, um, you know, Seckler has written about the atectonic and Hoffman as an example of someone who, who, who represses the, the construction detail behind um, uh, finishes and so on. So even in a case where it's repressed, there's a meaning to be uncovered in understanding how that's happening. I think the discussion with Meyer about whether the surface of those vaults would be smooth, stuccoed, or show the concrete is very much the tension between a kind of tectonic sensibility or a sensibility that wants abstraction. Um, but it doesn't mean if it's abstract that it doesn't have behind that abstraction a, a sophistication that can be discovered. You know, it's like the World Trade Center Tower you know, nobody knew, really, until we did that drawing, and then everyone was quite astonished at how inventive it was. It 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 was it was effectively solid, but. The, the edges were, were um, recessed um, so they could pour a grout between them to bond them together. And then they had holes in them in both directions for the rods. Um, they, had, they used rods to, to um, post-tension them during the erection so that as they went up, they jacked them to hold everything together. And then there was a whole other series of ducts where cables went after the whole thing was put together to add more post-tensioning. So you had, you know,
know, it was sort of Swiss cheese. But around that, it was all the same contract, uh, concrete through and through. Okay. I think uh, I'd like to thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.